Um, so thanks so much for, for being here today, everyone. I'm um, thrilled to see so many people here. Um, it's a really wonderful, warm welcome to UBC. This is my first talk that I've given um, as, a, as a member of the First Nation and Indigenous Studies program. So it's wonderful to see you all here. So Gila Kasla. Uh, my name is Tlali Gila Ogwa, and my ancestors on my dad's side from, come from Sahis, or what's now known as Fort Rupert. My ancestors on my mom's side are settlers of Ukrainian and English heritage, and I first want to acknowledge, of course, and give thanks to the Musqueam of the Halkomenum speaking people, whose unceded ancestral and occupied lands we have the privilege of gathering on here today. And as a visitor, I endeavor to be a good guest in these territories, which begins with acknowledging that Musqueam people have lived in reciprocal responsibility to these lands for millennia. And it's because of their, because of their generosity that I'm able to speak here today. Second, I want to thank the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice, and especially Jen Sung for the invitation and for organizing this talk. And I also, uh, again, want to thank you for coming here today. I hope this talk will contribute to our collective and individual visions for self-determination, decolonization, and justice here in these occupied lands. My talk today is a bringing together of work in anti-violence advocacy, queer decolonial politics, and theories of self-determination, and indigenous resurgence, which are rooted in the everyday material realities of our kin. More importantly, this talk is rooted in my networks of intimate relations with people of all genders who faced violence in all its manifestations, and my personal obligation um, as a two-spirit coagul person to envision forms of life in which we can all thrive. I'm thankful to my friends, relatives, and colleagues who continue to inspire and shape my own thinking here today. In my teachings, it's important to always cite the genealogy of thinkers whose stories have shaped your own knowledge. And today you'll see the importance of community leaders, young people, queers, two-spirit writers, and women and girls resisting violence daily who have all shaped my thinking. So when I was preparing for this talk, I started out with a paper full of decolonial and queer theory, quotes from community activists, and statistics on violence. And I've ended up with no statistics, very little theory, and instead um, kind of my own thoughts about decolonizing anti-violence movements. So these are complex issues to try to capture um, at all, but never mind the, the kind of time we have today. So I welcome your questions and conversation afterward, and I think this is something I, I will always um, be thinking about and refining over the years. Today I want us to remain open to rethinking dominant conceptions of violence and gender, how the, we think of those, those concepts in the context of decolonial processes and relationships here on these lands. And I want to begin by transporting us across time and space to the island community of Alert Bay, where 32 years ago I entered a big house for the first time. And in stepping onto the dirt floor I began to learn Quaggyuth cosmology through the embodiment of our potlatch laws. Suppressed through their criminalization for more than 80 years, the potlatch songs, dances, and ceremonies are an expression of Quaggyal rights, laws, obligations, and business, as well as the space in which we foster reciprocal responsibilities <coughs> to our human and animal neighbors and to each other. Many, if not most, of the Quaggyal potlatch ceremonies entail some form of shape-shifting, moving between worlds, between forms, from bear to human, from the spirit realm to the mortal world, as well as some form of relationship between diversely situated beings. Here the essence of my teachings as a Kwagil person, as Tlali Hila Ogwa, came alive then, as it does now when I return home for ceremony, as my body traced the movement of song which had been danced in those lands for generations. There are no English words for this feeling, for this lineage, for the complexity of meaning which is to be oriented toward the laws of my ancestors in this way that is at once embodied, material, spiritual, legal, relational. It's beyond English words. I begin here because there is violence in making ourselves fit into dominant epistemologies, into uncomfortable words which categorize us in ways that are legible in this society, because my starting point isn't actually violence, but what exists underneath and before violent relations were imposed. Today, as I talk about confronting interconnected violences in the context of settler colonialism, I want us to always remember that another way of being is not only possible, it is already alive in our bodies, in our being, in the lands beneath the concrete, beneath the settler society that has been mapped forcibly upon the territories and bodies of diversely situated, of, of diverse indigenous peoples. <clears throat> 
I begin in this way to avoid what Eve Tuck has called damage-centered research, which she, she says saturates our communities in the fantasies of outsiders. While I will be talking about violence today, it probably won't be in the way you're used to, as I intend to center activations of Indigenous people's agency in order to saturate our communities instead in the hopes and dreams of our ancestors and of generations yet to come. So I won't be recounting numbers of murders or sexual assaults of women, girls, or two-spirit people, nor statistics of suicide rates um, of youth and others, though the prevalence of this violence serves as the urgent backdrop for my analysis. So I now want to take us from that childhood potlatch experience to the space and time of another first, that of my first Women's Memorial March here in the territories of the Hunkalminum speaking people, where I was a volunteer as an undergrad. So on February 14th, 1997, I stood at Maine and Hastings along with a few other people, a few other hundred people, to pay tribute to the women who'd been killed, abducted, or otherwise disappeared from the downtown east side. As I stood amongst the crowd, I scanned the dozens of names of missing and murdered women that had been painted on banners, hoisted high by March organizers. And my breath stopped when my eyes settled on the name Sheila Hunt, which had been printed on a banner. It was at this breathless moment that I realized the extent of silence around issues of substance use, poverty, sex work, and marginalization amongst our kin. And I realized that if Sheila was my auntie, I may never have heard about her because of the internalized stigma and shame in our communities. And this was a life-changing moment in which I began to understand my personal obligation as a quagga person to address these societal and communal silences. But it would take more than 15 years of talking about violence, of doing anti-violence work, before I would learn that I had overlooked an important fact about the women whose names had been lovingly painted side by side on those banners. At least one of the missing Indigenous women named Kelly was a trans woman. How is it possible that after talking to so many downtown Eastside advocates, family members of missing women, as well as reading the work of scholars, researchers, and activists who focus on this issue, that it took so long to find out that one of the missing women who was on the original list um, of missing women from the downtown east side was trans? Well, intersections of racism, poverty, sexism, and anti-sex work sentiments continue to be examined in relation to the prevalence <coughs> of violence against Indigenous women in spaces across Turtle Island. Very little has been said by national Indigenous women's organizations, national Indigenous leadership, community groups, scholars, and activists working to address violence about the particular factors impacting violence against Indigenous trans, genderqueer, and two-spirit people. And in fact, the lives of two-spirit people, and in particular, uh, trans and gender non-conforming people are often overlooked entirely, other than in conversations explicitly focused on LGBTQ2S issues, or in those spaces shaped by two-spirit people ourselves. More broadly, gendered analyses of power in Indigenous communities tend to focus exclusively on men and women, especially male violence towards women, reinforcing the gender binary and erasing the realities of anyone who, who doesn't fit into that. Restricting conversations about violence to binary conceptions of gender makes it impossible to ask questions about the ways that people who don't identify as cisgender women, um, why, why they're particularly impacted and are, um, how they're particularly impacted by violence. And more fundamentally, this makes it impossible for the lives of women like Kelly to be made visible on her own terms. So how did Kelly identify? Did she identify as a trans woman, as two-spirit? Like me, Kelly was from a coastal First Nation. She was of Nuchanoth um, ancestry. Was she able to access housing, health care, and other services that met her needs and that were culturally safe, recognizing both her indigeneity and gender identity? In mourning her passing, how can we ensure the fullness of her life is witnessed and honored? And importantly, this restriction also makes it impossible for trans lives, people's lives, to be considered in anti-violence efforts in our communities today. Taken up in another register, this is where a little bit of a little gesture to theory comes in. Um, these questions relate to discussions of agency and representation within post-colonial theory. So Gayatri Spivak speaks of an ethics of responsibility, cultivating the capacity to respond to another without demanding resemblance as the basis of recognition. Ultimately, this entails creating new representational strategies, as well as revitalizing those of our ancestors 
in order to create communities in which people of all genders can be humanized in recognition of their position as self-determining subjects. And I understand these questions about Indigenous subjectivity as integral to the revitalization of our self-determination and recognition of the laws of our ancestors. So in tension with their legal subjectivity under the Indian Act, as I'll talk about as Indians, Indigenous people have maintained and sustained our own legal subjectivity through activations of cultural, legal, and political systems that were here prior to settlement. Unrecognized by Canadian law, they're productive, or, or often unrecognized, they're productive of categories of knowledge and identity which are lived in, sometimes in tension with those imposed and enforced through Canadian law. As Indigenous legal scholars, Napoleon and Overstall write, legal principles and obligations of Aboriginal law are reflected in the actual work, structures, and life of present-day Aboriginal people and communities. So it's not within queer theory or gender theory but within these everyday practices and principles of Indigenous resurgence that I want to locate my analysis today, which work to rupture the logics of uh, colonial gender relations premised on violence. Relations I want to turn my attention to now. So at the heart of the colonization of Turtle Island lies, as we know, the settler colonial project of native disappearance, which is necessary for the development of a prosperous settler society. Colonial laws and ideologies have entailed the imposition of gendered and racialized categories which have been used to ensure fewer and fewer natives over time. So as Joanne Barker has written, legislated in 1876 here in Canada, the Indian Act established patrilineality as the criterion for determining Indian status, including the rights of Indians to participate in banned government, have access to banned services and programs, and to live on reserves. Thus, status Indian women, as a separate legal and social category from other Canadians, became disenfranchised through marriage to non-status men, impacting their children for generations to come. And this has been called a total institution. The Indian Act has touched on all aspects of the lives of status Indians and was designated with explicit intent to assimilate us into Canadian society anticipating the eventual and total dissolution of banned governments with the implementation of gendered power relations among men and women at its core. According to Joanne Barker, the act can thus be seen as an instance of co-constitutive relationship of sovereignty and gender. This systemic imposition of heteropatriarchy through Canadian law was also materialized in our homes, our families, the intimate spaces in which we come to know ourselves and one another. And at its root, the replacement of Indigenous identities, which emerged out of land and ocean-based cultural teachings and obligations, with colonial identities based in Western concepts of race, gender, and sexuality, was a denial of our ability to be self-determining. At both communal and individual scales, the Indian Act gave rise to categories of rights and status, which restructured our kinship relations, attempting to disconnect us from our lands, our kin, our home, our children, and our own sense of self. Indian residential schools were integral to process of, of imposing racialized gender hierarchies among diverse Indigenous communities. <clears throat> at the same moment as Native children became Indians through their institutionalization at these schools, they were simultaneously gendered as Indian boys and girls as systems of race and gender were mutually articulated enforcing and creating one another. So individual accounts of residential school students clearly show the, gen the gender uniforms as one colonizing tool. Boys had their hairs cut short, girls wore bobs and bangs, uh, depending on the, the school that they went to and the time, of course, and they were physically separated from one another in the schools, kept in different dorms in order to ingrain distinct gender roles into them. Residential schools divided sisters and brothers from one another imposing racialized gender norms onto the bodies of native children while denying their traditional roles, which of course differed cross-culturally. In these schools, indigenous children were often taught to be ashamed of their bodies, their sexualities, and their indigeneity, both through indoctrination into Christian teachings as well as through widespread systematized abuse. The imposition of a gendered hierarchy included the normalization and expectation of violence against indigenous women by both native and non-native men. Two-spirit people and trans people pose a threat to these heteropatriarchal relations as they don't facilitate this imposition of male dominance over women. 
So the lack of recognition of any gender variance, um, other than we, we do see some, of course, in anthropological texts, but certainly not in the definition of Indian rights and status, was one way to try to, to force indigenous people into gendered expressions of colonial power. And this erasure was significant, as it's been documented that more than two thirds of the native languages in North America recognized more than two genders. Moreover, traditional indigenous gender roles are not only about identities and responsibilities of women and men and other gendered people, but about those people who harvest ulican, these people who harvest clams, the people who fish, those who clean, smoke, and can the fish, who hold the knowledge of our songs, these who stoke the fire at the center of our big house. All of the roles and responsibilities that people hold within our communities were and are vital for our existence. Yet after many generations of native children being confined within these strictly gendered spaces, along with the imposition of the Indian Act governance, the gender binary has become naturalized. The erasure and invisibility of those we now call two-spirit and transgender people was accomplished through these combined ideological, socio-legal, and spatialized enforcements of colonial gender norms for Indians. The institutionalization of gender roles has meant not only the suppression of two-spirit traditions, but also the ways that men and women relate to one another and to the spiritual, ceremonial, and cultural significance of what it means to be a Quagyuth man, a Quagyuth woman, or other diversely gendered people within our nations. Um, thus, the forced disappearance of locally defined systems of gender, I would, I think, is, is um, importantly central to the settler project of native disappearance. So we know that heteropatriarchy continues to shape indigenous women's lives in ways that are violent, deathly, and dehumanizing. And we have been fighting for many years to make visible the impact of everyday, relentless, ongoing violence against indigenous women and girls through local level action, as well as the emergence of uh, national discourse on missing and murdered women. But these cases of the most extreme forms of violence are only part of the picture. Other kinds of sexual, physical, and emotional violence continue to go unseen, unspoken, and unacknowledged within our, our communities. One resistant strategy of Indigenous women has been to fight for gender justice within the colonial structures our lives are bound up in, which continue to hold immense power. So we've worked to make violence against Indigenous women count in ways that might trigger a widespread response, appealing to police, the government, international bodies, um, as well as to one another. Much work has also been done to address structurally enforced inequality for status and non-status Indian women, and some changes have been made. Yet two-spirit and trans-Indigenous people have largely been kept out of view in the gender analyses employed in these efforts. And I would argue this is in part because seeking recognition within state delineated forms of justice involves taking up categories that already matter, that already count. And we know that people living beyond the binary continue to be categorically omitted in different ways. Looking to national anti-violence movements and some of the mechanisms to address violence against indigenous women and girls, traditional concepts of gender um, are often invoked. So for example, the Native Women's Association of Canada calls for, here's a quote, a cultural framing that reflects Aboriginal ways of knowing, Aboriginal histories, both pre and post contact, and contemporary Aboriginal realities of ca in Canada. So from my perspective, the recognition of two-spirit people, including trans people in Indigenous histories and society, is contemporary society is in line with the vision described here. But it's not reflected in the way gender is understood in NWAC's policy frameworks. So they state um, in their uh, kind of outlining what an indigenous gender analysis is. Traditionally, the sexes functioned as cooperative halves. Roles were equally valued. Independent yet interdependent, each half worked to create the perfect whole in society. So this, is, um, this asserts that equality was integral. Oh, did I? Yes, I miss. Uh, cut and pasted that, sorry. Um, so in working to address violence against Indigenous women, um, such as the documentation of cases of missing and murdered women, trans feminine people are sometimes included in categorizations of women, but the extent of that inclusion is largely unknown. 
So for example, the 2010 Sisters in Spirit report, which captured the stories of nearly 600 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, in their methodology, they say that the study included people who were female or living as a woman, includes transgender or transsexual Aboriginal women. And yet this is the only mention of trans women in the whole report. So it's unclear whether any trans women stories were included there at all. And Two, two Spirit is not mentioned in that report. Um, this is also true in legal measures to address missing and murdered women. So the inquiry to investigate the police handling of cases of missing women in Vancouver's downtown east side did include Kelly's story. Um, volume one of the report from that inquiry says, the subjects of the missing person and murder investigations reviewed in this report were individual people. They were all women. Kelly Little was born a man. They include her male name, but I'm not gonna say it. Kale Kelly Little was born a man, but identified as a woman at the time she went missing. Throughout this report, we refer to women as they are the focus of the missing women investigation. And then the report goes on to state that men and transgender people may also be prey to serial predation and violence, and that the recommendations of the report concerning safety should be read as applying equally to them. So it's left up to the reader to remember to apply the findings to transgender people because they're only mentioned um, in two other minor places in all of the volumes of the report from that inquiry. The two places are um, recommendations for safe housing to be created for transgender sex workers and a police advisory committee formed to work with, um, they say, populations with significant public safety issues such as the LGBT community. So again, two spirit people are never mentioned. So in the inquiry's recommended strategies to decrease gendered violence in the downtown east side, constrained and limited though they may be from the inquiry process, specific measures for trans women are excluded. This exclusion is continued in many indigenous organizations, spaces of leadership and politics. And for example, the National Aboriginal Health Organization states that their goal is to be respectful and inclusive of all First Nations, Inuit and Métis populations, including men, women, children, youth, and the elderly. So this is very common language that we see. Such analyses, of course, continue to construct the lives of trans and other two-spirit people as an impossibility through their categorical omission. And this has a direct impact on the well-being of two-spirit people who are left out of policy discussions, program development, and the allocation of resources which impact daily life. Uh, further, it impacts our young relatives who are accessing youth workers, healthcare providers, or teachers who don't have any understanding of their shifting gender pronouns or questions about their bodies. And this is something I continue to hear um, from youth serving agencies that I work with, that uh, youth practitioners just don't get it that youth are talking about gender pronouns, they don't understand what that means, which can result in youth being shamed or their chosen gender identities dismissed. In order to access services, rights, or gender, then two-spirit people are made to fit themselves into imposed categories which have their roots in the colonial project of indigenous disappearance. So Mi'kmaq Acadian artist uh, Louis S. May Cruz writes of feminist discussions of gender oppression in the wonderful book, Feminism for Real, Deconstructing the Academic Industrial Complex of Feminisms. Um, here's a quote from Lewis. Two-spirit people can talk about our oppression only when it parallels women's experiences. When our lives get too complicated, we're judged, ignored, punished, humiliated. Whether it's women-only or men-only space, the naming of a space as only one gender encourages invasion and conquest because they don't allow people to be the complex creatures we are. This pushes two-spirit people to the margins simply because we are not one thing or another. We need liberation from the confines of gender baggage too. This parallels the larger call from indigenous sovereignty movements asking for our native nations to be recognized as distinct sovereign entities. We are necessarily unique and complex for a reason." End quote. So organizations, governments, and community groups calling for women and girls to have political, economic, and social power and the restoration of traditional roles I think must begin to ask themselves how non-binary traditional and contemporary realities are and can be addressed in these efforts. To not do so is to continue to define violence through a heteronormative lens, such as homophobia and transphobia are not considered violence, nor seen as connected to other expressions of colonial power. 
Addressing the roots of colonial violence and creating communities that are less violent requires the recognition and celebration of diverse gender roles, reflective of the reality of all our relations. And as uh, Two-Spirit uh, writer Courtney Dakin writes, decolonization involves reframing our concepts about indigenous governance and working to build strong indigenous nations that honor self-determination, gender variance, and the contributions of indigenous women, Two-Spirit, and LGBTQ individuals. With the recreation of Two-Spirit identities and reclamation of traditional roles within our respective communities, the need to withdraw from them dissolves. And that's the end of that quote. So here on the coast, our very peoplehood, uh, our being is shaped by teachings of the undersea world, the sky world, the mortal and immortal worlds brought to life in the potlatch and in our relations with our human and non-human relations. Looking to the undersea world and the natural diversity that thrives there in order to sustain life, we begin to understand that imposing a binary on our diversity of gendered bodies souls and minds is like trying to divide the ocean in half. Imagine this drop of water belongs over there, this one here, and you must firmly and violently impose the structures through which this split has been placed. Imagine the constant work of trying to control the ocean to keep each drop in its correct place. But we don't need to imagine this because many people are constantly being policed, constantly being told to get back in their correct gendered place, and if they fail to do so, the consequences are often violent. So decolonization means removing that divide so the ocean's natural diversity can thrive. And focusing away from national discourses and politics toward the intimate spaces of our friendships, family relationships, and network of kin, we know this is already happening. As a continuation of Two-Spirit leadership, today we see a vital presence of Indigenous people centering the voices, lives, and realities of people with diverse gender identities in anti-violence movements at a local level. So over the past few years, we've seen discussions of missing and murdered women expanded to include girls in recognition of the fact that many of the people facing violence are youth. A number of the community-led organizations, activists, and artists have further expanded this to include Two-Spirit people recognizing both that some of the missing and murdered uh, may not have identified as women, though they may have been female, and also that people who are gender fluid, trans, or otherwise gender non-conforming also face targeted gender violence emerging from colonialism. So seeing gender violence as inclusive of two-spirit people is one shift led by community organizers. So a related example can be seen in the traveling memorial art um, installation, Walking With Our Sisters led by artist Christy Belcourt and a circle of uh, organizers. So the memorial project um, now includes specific memorialization for two-spirit people whose lives have been taken, creating a place to honor their lives alongside those of women and girls, as well as children who never came home from residential schools. And whether recognized or not, there has always been vibrant leadership and presence of two-spirit people at women's memorial marches, often in roles supporting women organizers. So although it may be not made visible in official categories of recognition through the state, people of all genders working, loving, and activating change side by side um, in our daily lives, this has been happening all along. Two-spirit knowledges, histories, traditions, and stories are being vibrantly reclaimed in ver diverse contexts across this land, revitalizing ways of relating to one another which are rooted in intimacy and recognition of one another's subjectivity on decolonial terms. Fundamentally, anti-violence movements rooted in indigenous self-determination are incomplete without diversely gendered people because living and loving beyond the binary is itself a decolonial strategy. Two-spirit existent ruptures colonial logics which structure heteropatriarchal relations, those same logics which normalize violence against indigenous women. And this is made clear in diverse definitions of two-spirit which is understood as accounting for intersections of gender, sex, and sexuality among Indigenous peoples, historically and currently. So within an embodied experience of defining Two-Spirit, um, Alex Wilson writes, when we call ourselves Two-Spirit people, we are proclaiming sovereignty over our bodies, gender expressions, and sexualities. Coming in doesn't center on the declaration of independence that characterizes coming out in mainstream depictions of the lives of LGBTQI people. Rather, coming in is an act of returning, fully present in ourselves, 
to resume our place as a valued part of our families, cultures, communities, and lands in connection with all our relations. Wilson goes on to say that coming in is about circling back to where we belong, reclaiming, reinventing, and redefining our beginnings, our roots, our communities, our support systems, and our collective and individual selves. So beyond being about gender and or sexuality, two-spirit identity is for Wilson and many others the reclamation of an embodied cultural role. As Leanne Simpson has said, our political systems cannot operate without all the communities that make up our nations because excluded bodies means excluded relationships and excluded knowledge and excluded connection. When we adopt and invoke colonial hierarchy in our lives, we fundamentally change the relationships we're in and the people that we are. In order to dislodge heteropatriarchal power relations which normalize both violence against indigenous women and erasure of trans and two-spirit lives, we must see the importance of a reorientation towards identities and responsibilities arriving from our own territorial relations, but at the same time addressing transphobia um, and cisnormativity alongside other expressions of colonial power. Recognizing that we don't currently have a culturally rooted system of justice in place in which to deal with violence against women, trans people, or any of our relations on a daily basis, we also need to strategically take up sometimes state categories of rights. Thus, trans and two-spirit people must be engaged in shaping decisions about pushing for visibility um, strategically in those official spaces of justice. So given this simultaneous relationship to both colonial and indigenous systems of, of law and recognition, we must also make, make room for shape-shifting, situational and context-specific identities. And I think this really um, is different than kind of identity politics. In the big house, for example, someone who is female may take up a male role in ceremony by singing around the drum, and in that space may identify only within that role, a singer or drummer. This is a cultural role, not one necessarily defined by gender. The same person may identify as genderqueer among their friends, two-spirit among other indigenous queer people, and perhaps as a First Nations woman when fighting for on-reserve housing rights or fighting for custody of their kids. The ability to be self-determining people means we can exercise this right of choice over our bodies and identities as we do, as we aspire to do over our territories. To be called by our names, to be recognized by our ancestors, to uphold the responsibilities we have to our lands and to one another. And yes, to strategically engage with a state when we need to for as long as it continues to hold power in our daily life. This fluid identification also works against the sedimented logics of state power which have worked to control indigenous lives through our categorization in which violence and erasure are naturalized. So within the big house, in spaces where our cultural responsibilities are enacted, I do see some roles that are gendered, but many others that are about cultural and individual responsibility attached to your own name, to your role. We cannot function as a culture without each of these roles. The same teachings which are at the heart of mending our relationships with the land, with our neighbors, with our children, elders, intimate partners, um, are at the foundation for ending violence in our lives. They teach us how to hold one another up and to witness one another in the ways of our ancestors. So as a mixed blood Kokwakiwak woman, my own orientation has always been towards the shoreline. Not the ocean itself, but the space where water meets land and light, where the tides turn all the elements together in an ever-present, yet ever-changing jumble. Staring out from this place, I frequently think of Sisiu, the double-headed sea serpent, who can bring wealth to someone who is lucky enough to see it, or on the other hand can bring death by shape-shifting into a canoe, only to swallow those who ride in it. Sisiu was my grandmother's crest, reminding me of our potential to transform ourselves into different forms in order to serve our communities and our own purposes. In my work on violence over the years, I began to see that we are in the process of transforming our legal and social identities so that we can now recognize one another, not only as victims, but also as agents of renewal. The time has come to take seriously our personal and collective potential for transformation creating spaces of socio-legal change, collision, and multiplicity in which we can reimagine our communities, 
ourselves and one another anew. Thank you.